So this is Lesson from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. Uh, this is lesson number six in that series. Uh, the title of this lesson is A Model for Repentance. And um, you know, we're taking lessons from various kings, I said, and uh, so this particular lesson is the third one in the series uh, um, on King David. Different, different um, episodes in his life, different things about his life from which we can uh, gather uh, valuable information, hopefully lessons for today. Uh, I want to begin uh, this particular lesson by reading a uh, passage of scripture familiar to uh, all of us in Acts uh, chapter two. Uh, so if you'll read along with me, it says, therefore, uh, this is Peter, of course, the apostle, speaking to the crowd on Pentecost Sunday. He's preached the gospel to them. Uh, they have responded, you know, well, you know, they have responded to him, men and brethren, what, what should we do? You know? And so he answers, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in this particular passage, we read one of the most oft quoted passages, certainly in the church, certainly in the churches of Christ. And it's a key passage because it answers the crucial question, what must I do to be saved? What's my part? How do I respond to God? And it's, you know, it's clear and it's, it's concise. Now from experience, um, I would say that most of the time when we use Acts chapter two, verse 38, we quickly explain repentance, you know, it means uh, turning away or turning from sin, and then we move on to give a lot of attention and teaching to baptism. We, you know, we talk a lot about baptism. How should someone be baptized? Why should someone be baptized? What's the manner of it? Who should be baptized? So we, you know, we give a lot of information about baptism, and, and this is necessary, of course, but baptism is a witness of our faith, while repentance is the actual inner working of our spirit as we turn to God in faith. So this subject you know, deserves to be examined more closely than we normally do. In a Bible study with someone, we usually don't spend as much time explaining repentance as we do explaining baptism. And uh, I'm thinking you know, both should be well explained, let's put it that way. So for this reason, I'd like to study a good model for repentance given to us by David. And there's David's part in this lesson in Psalm 39. So if you have your Bibles, if you'd rather you know, read from your Bibles, then open them up to Psalm 39. And we're going to go through this textual study. This is still about David here, but instead of activity in David's life today, we're going to look at something that David wrote. All right. Little background on Psalm 39. Psalm 39 was written by David, of course, who was the king of Israel, 40 years, for 40 years, reigned approximately seven, eight hundred years before Christ. We know that he was a great warrior and a dynamic ruler who was loved by his people. He was also a man who had terrible weaknesses. You know, some people have weaknesses, but he had terrible weaknesses, terrible, terrible weaknesses and who succumbed to pride and sexual lust, lust which created tremendous problems in his family and nation. You know, he, he, uh, he seduced the wife of another man, she got pregnant, uh, he plotted to, kill her, to have her husband killed in battle, and then he covered everything up with a lie. And, uh, you know, I mean, we make mistakes, you know? uh, we go 10 miles an hour too fast in a 40 zone and we get a ticket. You know? But this is not just a mistake you know, that, that David did. This was a demonstration of how easily we can be drawn into terrible sin uh, if we're not uh, very, uh, very careful. Uh, another thing about David was that he was an eloquent poet and musician through whom God provided his people with many beautiful psalms and songs. Uh, to this day, we use the book of Psalms in our praise to God. One of these Psalms, Psalm 39, was written during a time when David was very ill 
or he was threatened by a dangerous enemy. You can, you can kind of go both ways here. This predicament caused him to pause and reflect upon his life and the condition of his soul. So during this time, we observe through his spirit-guided writing several elements that come together to produce true and effective repentance. The kind of repentance that God desires from all of those who have sinned against Him, great and small. So his psalms, you know, not only psalms of praise. We, you know, when we think of the psalms, we're always thinking, oh, the psalms, they're good for prayers. Or they're good for praise. You know? But they're good for a lot of other things too. A lot of other topics were covered in the book of Psalms and 39, Psalm 39 is, a, is an example of that. So let's begin reading Psalm 39. Uh, sorry. Uh, first of all, when we read Psalm 39, we see the very first thing that he does with this problem is that he tries to fix the problem himself. So we read Psalm 39. It says, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good and my sorrow grew worse. And so whenever we you know, are caught in a sin or a problem or we gaze inwardly and we see that we've been wrong, our first impulse many times is to be self-righteous. You know, fix it ourselves. And this effort at doing and saying what is right and avoiding further wrong on David's part produced two results that he talks about here. The first one is he began to see the wicked before him as truly wicked. You know, his attempt at doing right highlighted the evil that was actually around him. I don't know about you, but in my own life, my own you know, walk of faith, when I began dealing with particular sins in my life, whether it was, let's say, uh, using foul language, let's just use that, okay? Using foul, using swear words and foul language, and you know, never thought about it much growing up uh, you know, in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, I could swear in three languages. You know, this, was a, this was a big deal. You know, I could swear in English, I could swear in French, and uh, the only words I knew in Italian were swear words. You know? So, no biggie. But after I became a Christian, I, I realized that that's just not part of the Christian life, you know, uh, having a foul mouth. You know, I needed to clean that up. And as I began to try to exercise some self-control over the things that I said, especially you know, if I wanted to be funny or if I was upset with someone or if I was mad at somebody, I had to kind of you know, filter the language and it took time. But one of the side things that happened is that as I began to filter my own language, I began to realize how terrible other people's language was. A good example of that is, um, the, there's an old movie um, with uh, John Travolta, what was it, that, that movie uh, Saturday Night or something like that, some, some disco movie from way back in the 70s. And I remember in the 70s, you know, seeing that movie, going, going to see that movie, no big deal. You know? And one time I said, well, it would be uh, Saturday Night Fever, that's it. So I thought, you know, it'd be fun, you know, a little nostalgia, go back and see that movie once again. You know, and I popped it into the thing and hit play. I didn't get through 15 minutes of the movie. The language was so bad. I mean, it was terrible. And I, I was thinking to myself, how could I have not seen what was going on? Well, because I talked like they talked in the movie, that's why. They were talking like I was talking. I didn't see a problem with that. And so here, you know, just to bring this story back to David, when he began to you know, try to look inwardly and take care of his own problems and so on and so forth and realize some of the evil in his own life, he began to see evil in the world. I mean, the intensity of it in the world, that same kind of uh, experience. And then the second thing that happened was he began to, it, it, it began to stir within him greater feelings of guilt and sorrow. You, know, you, you look inside, you try to fix something that's on the inside by yourself. You begin to realize that it's a problem not only that you have, but that other people have. It's, it's all around you. 
and you see the intensity of it. So in other words, he realizes that he doesn't have a handle on this sin thing in his life. You know, it says, I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good. And what does he say? My sorrow grew worse. He might be silent. He might make an effort at thinking and doing right, but in making the effort, he sees how weak he is, how vulnerable he really is to sin. And going back to my own example, you know, uh, when I was, the more I dealt with you know, trying to have a, a cleaner mouth, you know, to my, my speech more pure, more in line with how a Christian should be, the, the easier it was, the stuff would just slip out of my mouth. You know, how, wow, boom, you know, something happened, I get upset, you know, bang. I remember in the house once, you know, when all the kids were very small and, and I got upset about something, you know, lost my temper and just you know, cursed. You know? <laughs> and uh, my little girl, you know, uh, Julia at the time, she must have been three or four, she ran, mommy, mommy, daddy said a bad word. You know? So, I mean, and I was saying to myself, how, how did I let that thing get out? I said to myself, I'm going to discipline myself. That's not the kind of language I'm going to use. And there I was losing my temper and using that language in front of my own child, who I would discipline for using, using that, language, uh, that language. So an effort to fix it himself in this context, David is talking about, yields the frightening result that he has actually no power to control or to remove his own sinfulness or his own desire to sin. So that brings him to the next stage in the process. He recognizes the effect of sin. Uh, in verse three, he says, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. So he sees the ravages of sin and iniquity within himself. He's hot inside. He doesn't even try to justify himself with the doing of good anymore since he sees it's useless. In verse four, he says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. And so he realizes that his only hope is to appeal to God. So he asks God to let him know the final results of his own life of sin. Tell me what's going to happen if I keep going in this direction. Verse five, he says, behold, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my lifetime is nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Selah, and Selah there is an expression, it's like a pause, pause, reflect. It means to pause and reflect on what's just been said. So he sees that even at his very best, he's not worthy of God. So in his present state, surely there is no hope. In other words, you know, when I try my very, you know, when I recognize sin within myself, when I see you know, myself for who I am, when I make my absolute best effort to be good and to do right, I still don't arrive at, you know, at righteousness. I'm still not as good as I want to be. Never mind being as good as God wants me to be, I'm not even as good as I want me to be. Imagine that. So David, in the poem, in the psalm here, <laughs> experiences the awful realization that life is not only fleeting, but sinful life is unacceptable before God and will be punished by condemnation. And there's not a whole lot that he can, he can do about it. So he, that's the setup, he sets up the problem. Okay? Third thing that he, uh, third you know, level here, in his, you know, this is the story of his repentance, okay? The story of repentance in any man, but this is the story of David's repentance. So he tries to fix it himself, he recognizes the effect of sin and how short his life is, and then he asks for forgiveness. So once he recognizes his helplessness to actually live up to God's standards, regardless of his efforts, David is ready to humble himself and ask for what he cannot achieve through personal effort. You know, sometimes people say, 
Yeah, that preacher sure is preaching a lot about sin. It's always about sin. He's always describing you know, the shortfalls and the shortcomings. He's always, always giving details about you know, what sin is and how we are tangled up in it. You know, I wish we'd talk more about positive things. Well, it's true, you can't always be preaching about sin. You know, a good preacher will hopefully deal with a lot of different subjects in a different way. But it's very important to preach on the, the issue of sin because if we don't know what sin is, and if we're not convicted of it, we're certainly not going to ask for forgiveness. You know, how, how do people come to Christ? What is it that motivates them to come to Christ? Well, they realize that they're sinners. Why, what, why else would they come to Christ? Why else would somebody in the world, enjoying the world, why else would that person want to come to Christ? There has to be a realization that there's something missing in my life. There has to be the realization, the, the true realization that I'm not a perfect person. Not just like some people say, oh, I guess I'm not perfect, and they use that excuse, I guess I'm not perfect, to continue in their imperfection. <laughs> it's like a catch-all excuse that permits them to do anything they want. Well, I'm not perfect, so you know, I'll abuse alcohol. I'm not perfect, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start an affair with my neighbor's wife. Or, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm not perfect. Well, that's not an excuse. I, I tell people, the excuse, I'm not perfect, that's not going to be a good excuse on the day of judgment. Don't say that to God, I'm not perfect. <laughs> because God will say to you, I gave you a chance to be perfect, and you didn't take it. So it's important to preach about sin, not just about sin, but it is important to preach about sin because the, the need to be forgiven and the need to be right with God begins by being convicted of sin. That's the purpose of the law, to show us we fall short. And then hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll begin seeking a way to be with God and to be acceptable to God. And that's, where, that's when the good news is good news, right? That's when the gospel comes in. Good news, guess what? You're not perfect. Guess what? You are condemned. Guess what? No matter how hard you try, you can't be perfect. But Jesus gives you perfection through faith. That's good news for me. So David asks for forgiveness. Once he recognizes his helplessness to actually live up to God's standards regardless of his efforts, David is ready, as I said, to humble himself and ask for forgiveness. So let's look at verse six. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. So he sees that his own end is shared by others. Even those who make a great show of their righteousness by equating it to success in life. You see, in those days, if you were poor and oppressed, people considered this as a sign of God's displeasure with you because of your sins. That was the thinking in, in that era. I mean, the perfect example of that is Job. We know Job, the story of Job. Good man, righteous man, wealthy man, loses everything, his children, his family, his house, his goods, his service, everything, even his wife abandons it. You know, curse God and die, she says to him. Very encouraging words. And yet, and yet Job, throughout, you know, throughout his ordeal, what does he say? He said, I've not done anything to deserve this. You know, it, it, throughout the book of Job, it says, and Job hung on to his righteousness. What he meant, what, what he meant by that is, Job could not understand why this had happened to him because he was not an unrighteous man. He was a righteous man. There's a big difference between righteous and perfect. He didn't think he was a perfect man, but he was a righteous man. He sought to do what God wanted him to do. And what was the problem? His friends come and they, you know, the whole book is you know, uh, an interplay between what his friends say to him and what he says to his friends, but basically his friends come to him, the three friends, they mourn with him for a certain amount of time, and then they begin one at a time telling him what is wrong with him. And each one in their own way tells him, well, the problem with you is you're a sinner. You've done something bad and you're covering it up. If you just cough it up, if you just confess it, then all of this you know, will all of this will go away. And he, he would continually respond to them, no, no, I haven't sinned. I am a righteous man. You can't make me say something that it's, that's not true. 
There is no secret sin in my life. And in the end we find out that God had allowed him to be you know, reduced to the state that he was reduced, not because he was a sinner, but because his knowledge of God was imperfect. He needed to know God at a much deeper and grander level, and we find that out at the end. But the book of Job highlights this thinking that was prevalent in those days. If you're poor, if you're miserable, if you're sick, there's something wrong with you. There must be some, some sin in your life. Okay? And so uh, David is saying, you know, people are saying to me, you know, David, there must be something wrong with you. There's sin in your life. So being rich and successful, of course, on the other hand, were equated with right living. You, you know, they must be okay because they're wealthy. So David, in, in this poem, sees that this was not so. After all, he was a king. He was a rich king, and yet he saw himself as guilty and as a guilty sinner before God, you see. He's, he's questioning the common mindset of the era that rich people are favored by God and poor people are not. And he's saying, I'm a rich person and I'm a sinner. There's something wrong with me and yet I'm rich. So from this insight, he comes to see that all are sinners, rich and poor, and everyone is unworthy of God. Now today, those of you in this class, you probably can even quote the scripture to me. You know, Romans chapter three, verse, Verse 23, all are sinners, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So we kind of know that. That's part of our Christian mindset, that no, no one is perfect. All are sinners, right? But in David's time, for him to express this idea, this was, you know, this was kind of radical, that everybody was a sinner, rich and poor, the king, including the king. So from this insight, he comes to see, as I say, all are sinners, rich and poor, unworthy of God. So in verse seven he says, and now Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. So now at this point, David changes his focus in life. No longer will he try to achieve his own righteousness by self-will, self-effort. He now will put his hope for salvation into the hands of a merciful God. At that time, no one, no ordinary person would think that a king had to hope like a poor man on God for, sal for salvation. Verse eight to 10, he says, deliver me from all my transgression, make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute, I do not open my mouth because it is you who have done it. Remove your plague from me because of the opposition of your hand I am perishing. So he gives up trying to justify or deflect blame and he throws himself completely on the mercy that God offers to sinners who acknowledge their sins and turn away from them. I tell people, you know, if I'm doing some counseling and, and people have done something wrong, whatever it is, you know, they've just done something bad. You know, usually family, business, marriage problem, somebody's cheated, somebody's done this, somebody's had a divorce, whatever. And many times I hear the person given all the reasons that they're going to give God for, for what happened. Wasn't my fault, I was tired, only happened once, blah, 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 this and that. They weren't faithful. I remember one guy saying to me many, many years ago, he, he was unfaithful and his justification was, well, his wife had been unfaithful three years before. He had forgiven her. He had forgiven her. But then when he was unfaithful, he used the idea that she had been unfaithful to justify his infidelity. And I remember in the, in the office with him thinking this guy is like walking on a railroad track and there's a train heading about to run him over in the form of God's judgment. And I said to him, look, when you're in this kind of situation here, you don't go before God with all your self justification. You go before God and throw yourself on His mercy. That's, that's what you need to do. You need to go throw yourself on God's mercy. That is always the safest course of action. It's always foolish to go before God 
with self-justifying reasons for your behavior, your poor behavior. You throw yourself on His mercy. That's the wise course. This is what David is doing here. He changes his focus in life. He's not going to try to achieve his own righteousness now. He's going to put his hope for salvation in the hands of God. And then verse eight to 10, he gives up trying to justify or deflect blame, throws himself completely on the mercy of God. First, he asks God to forgive him for it is God's laws that are broken to begin with. He then asks God to protect him from enemies who are searching to take advantage of his weakness. You know, historically, we're not sure, was he sick and in his illness he began to kind of reflect and you know, an, an inner search of his conduct, which brings about this here. And he, he fears also that his enemies might take advantage of him because of his physical weakness. We're not quite sure here. Finally, he pleads with God to remove the weakness within him that made him vulnerable to attack and death in the first place. So his troubles force him to take a long, hard look at his life and moves him to finally acknowledge his needs for God's mercy and, here's the important part, his need to change. He's got to change. So in these few lines you know, of poetry, we see that he does appeal for mercy and he does change his attitude. Two necessary actions for true repentance to be at work. Repentance requires us to go to God and ask for His mercy, but it also requires us to make a decision that I'm going to, I'm going to change things. So David, four, David demonstrates the fruit of that repentance. So he tries to fix it, recognizes that he can't, asks for forgiveness, demonstrates the fruit of that repentance. So there needs to be a calling out to God for forgiveness and a willingness to change, but the biblical model of repentance always includes a real and abiding change in a sinner's life and attitude. I don't swear hardly anymore, <laughs> except at golfs maybe sometimes. I don't know if that counts. Right? <laughs> I don't, uh, first of all, I don't want to swear, that's for sure. And I don't most of the time. And the odd time when a word does escape because of anger or foolishness or whatever, uh, I am, I am uh, mortified at myself. And I ask God, please, let's, because my goal is pure speech all the time, pure speech all the time. So there's a change. Uh, I could play a, a tape recording of a, of, of a day in my life in 1975 and a day of my life in 2015 and there'll be a difference. The voice may sound the same, so on and so forth, but there'll be a difference in what comes out of my, there is a change. And that change was a willful change with God's, with God's help. So David comments on how his life has changed because of his own repentance before God. Verse 11, with reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath, Selah. So he has a new view of himself. He has, been, uh, he has seen rather that God's testing strips a person to the core. Exterior beauty, strength, ability to cope, many times all these things are removed. He has understood that this is necessary for a person to truly see himself in his true weakness and need before God. So David now sees how all men are truly weak and in need of God's mercy, having gone through the experience himself. He's the king, but he's been stripped down to nothing. He's weak as a baby because of the illness that he has. Sometimes it's not illness that strips us down, right? Sometimes we lose our job and sometimes we fail in our relationships and sometimes you know, we, we, we make an effort at something to build something and it just, you know, we, we fail, a flat out failure. 
It's at those times that God teaches us things. We, we rarely learn anything when we're on, on the mountaintop. We learn things when we're down in the valley. That's when we learn stuff. We're not always down in the valley, but when we are, if we learn nothing from it, it's great waste. 12 and 13, he says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner like all my fathers. Turn your gaze away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. So he has a clearer vision of life, its meaning and ultimate conclusion that first of all, all are strangers, not just the poor and the needy, but all are strangers and are separated from God. What Paul wrote in Romans, you know, 800 plus years later, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, you know, he, right here he, sa he says it, right here. So anyone that says, oh, that's a New Testament concept. No, 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 no. You, you read about that in the book of Psalms. Our true condition should bring us to sorrow and tears before God in repentance. I go back to my own story. So when I became a Christian, I would go to church, I would, you know, I would be with Christians, potlucks, ball games, things like that, social activities, worship, certainly. And it's there that I noticed the difference, again, I go back to my simple story, the difference in the language. When we would have a picnic and a ball game or something like that with the church, the language that was being used was so different from the language that was being used when I was with my worldly friends, playing ball or doing something. I could see the difference. I didn't want to be like them anymore, I want to be like these people over here. So David has a, a clear view our true condition should bring us to sorrow before God in repentance. Another thing that he sees, only God can heal us. Only God can deliver us from a wounded conscience caused by, caused by sin. Only God can do that. And then thirdly, he says, time is short. While we have breath, we need to appeal to God for mercy. After we die, it'll be too late to repent. You know, that is one of the most frightening ideas. There is, there is no second chance. I know there are some doctrines that are floating around within Christianity that says, you know, there'll be a, you'll have another thousand years you know, to kind of make it right. You know? No, that, that's the most dangerous thing about that doctrine that it nullifies the doctrine that says, today is the day of salvation, today. You only have the chance to repent, you only have the chance to be right with God, you know, today, while we're alive. After we die, too late, too late to repent. So David not only recognized the need for repentance and change in his life, he produced the kind of thoughts and actions that demonstrate that true repentance was actually taking place within him. Going back to my story, eventually what happened was my old friends and family were saying, I don't know, there's something different about you. I can't go, I put my finger on it. Maybe it was, I wasn't cursing you out when I was mad at you. Maybe that's what you notice that's different, right? And then with time, I was no longer comfortable there. I was only comfortable with the brothers and sisters. I didn't have to apologize for my good language. <laughs> and it was never a surprise to my Christian friends that if something happened, there was a disagreement or a misunderstanding that no bad words were spoken that those wrinkles and those problems were worked out, hopefully being worked out in love and kindness and understanding and forbearance. I wanted to be with these people over here all the time. Of course, 
our job is not to try to determine if true repentance is taking place in other people. You know, we tend to do that. We tend to be judging all the time. Boy, that guy's not far along in the repentance scale. But that's not our job. Our responsibility is to make sure that we are experiencing true repentance. And we are. If our repentance sees us actually making an effort, making an effort at restitution. Now rep repentance isn't restitution, don't get me wrong. Jesus makes restitution, 100% restitution on the cross. But you know, repentance means uh, if, you, if you've said something that was untoward or unkind and you can make it right, then make it right. Sometimes you can't. You know, there are some things I wish I could say to my mom, knowing what I know now, but I can't, she's gone. So there are some things you just can't do, right? Some things you can't take back, some things you can't fix. Thankfully, all restitution for everything is made by Jesus on the cross. That's, that's the good news. But some of the stuff that I can do, that apology that I can make, something I can make right, that's within my power to do it, yeah, I want to do it. That's, that's part of repentance. That's part of you know, sincere change. Also, we're turning to God for forgiveness <clears throat> and not to ourselves to, to find self-justification. You know, when I blow it and I do something, I remember as a young Christian, you know, it would take that long for me to finally get around to go to God and say, okay, I did this wrong, and I'm sorry, you know, help me. You know. And as I grew in Christ and as I get, you know, became more and more mature, that time between the sin and the asking for forgiveness, it grew shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter till there's hardly any space now. Why? Why would I want to waste time you know, being in that sin? I'm absolutely sure that God's going to forgive me. Why should I waste time? I go to Him immediately. And also, <coughs> excuse me, if our repentance is producing a change of heart that includes a greater sincerity and purity and dependence on God, then our repentance is true and effective in drawing, drawing us nearer to God. Remember, the purpose of repentance for us as Christians is to keep us continually close to God because sin separates us from Him. That's why I say you know, when, when you're that far between the sin and asking for forgiveness, well you're separated from God. You don't want that. You, you want to be close to Him all the time. I also believe that this kind of repentance needs to precede baptism. And when it does, it usually signals that this person will remain faithful long after they've come out of the water. So perhaps I might encourage you, those of you who might be teaching someone or sharing with someone or whatever, even thinking about it yourself if you haven't been baptized, spend a little bit of time talking about repentance before taking someone into the water. It'll, it'll be well worth the, the effort for them because they, they will truly appreciate what is taking place in the water when they go down in it knowing that their sins are forgiven because their repentance is sincere. Okay. So I wanted to, you, know, you, you, you can't do the life of David you know, without at least touching one psalm, something that he wrote. So this is the one psalm. Uh, next week, the final lesson in the David part, uh, and that'll be David's charge to Solomon. So we, we started with him and Goliath when he was a young guy, and uh, him and, uh, uh, you know, during his, uh, during his uh, reign, uh, and then now as he's getting older, uh, a psalm that he wrote and then we'll finish with him uh, at the end of his life giving the charge to Solomon before we move on in our series. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention.